I want to thank everybody for joining us today. If you just hold a few minutes, we're just trying to connect our face, uh, everyone live, and uh, we'll wait for the participants to join us, and then we'll get started. But we're here to talk about Forward Forum, Tier 3, Research and some Mitigation Explained. It looks like many people are joining us already. Um, if everyone can put their microphones on mute, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So good afternoon. And again, thank you all for joining us today as we welcome um, Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity to talk to us uh, today about tier three, our resurgence and mitigation and explain it a little bit further. Uh, we begin um, by uh, hearing from the Boone County Health Department as well and the Belvedere Area Chamber of Commerce on local impacts and what we can do to support our businesses. Um, this is very important for not only our businesses, but our families and friends. And uh, I also wanted to let you know that if you miss part of this uh, webinar or you want to share it with somebody, it will be recorded and available on our Forward Boone website um, at www.forwardboone.org as well as on Facebook. I'm Pamela lopez Fettis. Um, I'm your host today, as well as Executive Director to the Growth Dimensions. We're the Economic Development Organization for Belvedere and Boone County, Illinois. Growth Dimensions is one of the partner organizations that's been working together since March with our partners that are listed on our website. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, these, uh, we're trying to work together to provide our region with relevant, timely, and locally focused COVID information, as well as resources that are available. Our partners are here today with us to talk um, and provide us with uh, our presentation. Um, first, we have uh, Agnes Masnick. Um, she is the Northern Illinois State Line Regional Manager. Um, she's been working with us since January of 2020. Uh, she comes from the Office of Regional Economic Development uh, from the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic, Economic Opportunity. Um, she joined uh, the department in 2015 and served in various roles, but we're happy to, hear, to uh, have her with us today. She continues to be a great resource for all of us, providing our information and our region with the resources and uh, several presentations uh, uh, through our forward forums in the past few months. We also have a team on hand that will respond to questions, provide you with additional information and resources. Amanda Meal and Michelle Gibson are from the Boone County Health Department. We have Amy Grafton and Lee Revels from the Belvedere Area Chamber of Commerce. And finally, but not, le but just, uh, but not least, of course, is Jen Jackie from the Belvedere YMCA. Thank you all for joining us today. So our focus on today's presentation is to cover the following topics. Tier three resurgence and mitigation, our Boone County's health and safety, um, and how we can support our local economy through volunteering and giving back. And at the end of our presentation, we'll open this up to questions. And so if you're watching through Zoom, you'll be able to um, ask these questions through the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook, uh, through the live feed, please uh, type your questions into the comments section and we'll respond to them at the end of this presentation. Now I'd like to turn this over to Agnes to explain tier three mitigation. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, Forward Boone and, and my partners um, on the call today. Um, you know, Restore Illinois, um, Tier three um, resurgence mitigation um, that does take effect today, um, Friday, November 20th. So um, whether you're joining by Facebook or uh, via Zoom, or if you're calling in, um, we've tried, to, um, the D Illinois Department of Commerce has put together um, additional material for, for businesses and the public to hopefully um, provide greater clarity in in the third stage of the mitigation, so tier three. So um, here on the slide um, for the mitigation, we've, we've tried to really um, 
show um, in an easy way in the differential between, you know, we currently are in phase four. However, um, where there are tighter restrictions, we've um, tried to put them into two buckets. So we have on the left of the screen what industries are open and what um, are on pause or have been um, until our restore phase five. So we'll go through that today um, in the remainder of the presentation. Next slide, please. So all of these materials, um, this um, on the tier three resurgent mitigation, um, what we're showing on the screen, this is a screenshot of, of, a, of a complete, um, like I would call it a, um, it's actually a one page or both sides and it's translated um, in English and Spanish and it will cover all of the um, presentation information that we're providing. Um, really it's building on the information that was released in July to help um, make sure that we're to ensure our hospitals um, don't become overrun. So this tier does aim to limit gatherings, encourages people to stay home um, at the greatest extent possible, while also um, permitting industries to remain open um, at significantly reduced capacities um, and just making sure we have proper safety measures in place. Um, and We'll, um, the slides will hopefully, you know, will help answer some questions you may have and go over the guidelines as they're laid out. Next slide, please. And um, in addition, we have um, published some FAQs as of yesterday on the Illinois Department of Web or the, the Department of Commerce's website. And um, and if if we're not answering your questions. I know that the Illinois Health Department has a lot of this um, information as well, and um, the State Board of Education um, also has information on their website. So the Tier 3 resurgent mitigation uh, for bars and restaurants, uh, because we were in Tier 2 prior, um, some of this information um, is, is, not, is, is not new. However, um, we are asking bars and restaurants to close by 11 p.m., and reopen no earlier than six. Um, and it, we're continuing no indoor service. Um, if you have a tent um, outside, two of, of the walls have to remain open. Um, all bar and restaurant patrons should be seated at tables outside. Um, and we're, um, in addition, not allowing seating or congregating at the bar, so um, not having bar stools available. Um, tables should remain six feet apart as, as in before and making sure that no groups are um, congregating or waiting um, in, you know, in, in close proximity of each other. Um, no table should allow for six or more people um, outdoors and reservations are required for each party and we ask that restaurants keep um, that information for I believe 28 days. Um, in case um, that needs to be referenced um, in, in the future. And then no seating of multiple parties, um, and then no indoor gaming terminals, um, and suspend, um, excuse me, and include with, with, that would include private clubs and country clubs as well. Uh, next slide, please. So for health and fitness, um, we, there has been um, that we are no longer allowing, or excuse me, we're asking operating at no more than 25% capacity. Um, the change is no indoor group classes um, are available. Face coverings must be worn and while um, engaged in, in exercise regardless of what machine. Reservations are required. I know um, on some of the material saying, you know, walk-ins are allowed that you must um, be registered as, um, as a guest and locker rooms um, in the, in should be closed as well. Next slide, please. And for, for hotels, hotels occupancy should be limited to only the reg registered guests um, in those rooms and allowing the maximum allowance being the number of individuals permissible 
for the fire code. So um, the local fire department, if their fire code is not, you know, posted, then the fire department can be um, a good indicator of what that capacity would be. Um, fitness centers should be closed or operate only on a reservation basis. In addition to the previous um, slides, limited to 25% of the room's capacity. Uh, food can be available only on a grab and go basis and um, no event or meeting spaces um, are allowed. Next slide, please. I apologize, Agnes, um, and our guest today. Um, we had to reconnect to Facebook Live. Um, so if you just okay. a moment, um, if you can go ahead and speak to some of those um, points um, and just proceed as uh, if we had the slides going forward. Oh, I don't have any slides, so, hmm. Okay. Should I wait for the slides to join to get back on, or should I just talk through oh. the rest of the? Oh, that's okay. That was. Um, uh, I think we were on. Uh, sorry, apologize. Which one? Um, we in more recreation features. Yeah. Okay. You want me to start at indoor recreation? Please. Okay. Um, so, oh, this looks like the slides are, okay, great. So next slide, please. So indoor recreation theaters and cultural institutions, um, gaming and casinos um, are now closed. Uh, and if there is um, a gaming, or, you know, space in, in the bar that has to be closed as well. Um, and, and no indoor um, bar service is allowed. Um, indoor recreation centers, including theaters and performing arts centers and indoor museums um, and amusement centers are closed. Um, live streaming um, or performances are encouraged with social distancing of performers. Um, that's for outdoor activities and capacities limit at 25% or less. Um, and if you have groups, um, those uh, for outdoor activities, it's limited to 10 people or less. Um, reservations must are required, and face coverings are also required of all of all guests. All guests, excuse me. Next slide, please. So for manufacturing, we've um, we've added additional. Um, requirements for um, for manufacturers um, requiring additional COVID training for employees, um, even if previous training has occurred. Um, we are asking that manufacturers coordinate with the Department of Public Health to implementing testing protocols um, and really um, making sure that contact tracing um, is is in place in the protocols and uh, making sure that, that the protocols also address um, testing and available testing um, supplies. So um, just, I know that there, um, there has been some questions around this um, particular statement. So we are working to help provide clarity to our manufacturers, um, you know, for timing on the protocols and, and what is detailed, so we are working on that, and we will provide um, future updates to um, Forward Boon. So all um, manufacturing employees must wear face coverings um, at all times unless they are eating or drinking. And um, there are exemptions um, referenced for safety purposes. And only um, manufacturing staff and key personnel key personnel are um, allowed in facilities. So um, all non-production staff should um, work remotely and non-essential staff and visitors are not permitted. Um, so exemptions are critical equipment repairs and supply deliveries and safe for safety reasons. So um, you can continue to have um, those um, types of um, activities um, still occurring 
for your facility. Next slide, please. Okay, um, all critical visitors must ha um, have an health and excuse me, employee health and safety approved risk assessment done upon entry, um, including any um, travel history, tracking of temperatures upon entrance um, to the manufacturing facility, um, making sure that workstation alignment um, is done when feasible, uh, staggering shift space, or excuse me, space, space shifts, and making sure that um, shift entrances and exits, um, you know, trying to really look at um, ways to make sure that employees, you know, are not, a large amount of employees are not, you know, in close proximity of each other, um, you know, when when different um, times, you know, like beginnings of shifts or, or the end of shifts are occurring. Um, and allowing for sanitation um, stations um, and making sure that um, sanitations are required at the beginning of end of, of shifts are occurring. Operators must suspend COVID-related incentive pay um, and promote staying at home when sick um, or, if, or if your employees are showing symptoms. Um, making sure that there's an implemented temporary leave policy to accommodate workers who are sick. Um, developing and implementing safety protocols for employees, travel vans to promote spacing, requiring um, those to also wear face coverings, um, in implementing temperature checks and making sure that proper air ventilation um, and vehicle sanitation is occurring. Next slide, please. So I know um, with, with the Thanksgiving holiday approaching um, with tier three, we are um, going, we also have um, guidance for meeting and social events and, and gatherings and office meetings. Um, it is um, in the tier three mitigation is limit in-home gatherings to household members. Um, you know, if if you are going to celebrate, you know, use opportunities to do it electronically, just like we are um, hosting a Zoom today. Um, you, meeting rooms, banquet centers, private party rooms, private clubs, country clubs may not host gatherings. So those need to be um, closed, no party buses, um, funerals are limited to 10 family members of the descendants, um, and that does not include um, staff, and it does reference um, more details are on the Department of Public Health website. Um, all employees who can work remotely should work remotely. Next slide, please. And here, um, resurgence mitigation, organized group recreational activities. Um, we do have Jen Jackie here as well. She might answer some questions if, if more um, pop up um, later during her question and answer period. But we are um, pausing all indoor group and sporting recreational activities for youth and adult recreational sports. One-on-one um, -on -one training may um, continue. Um, if there is a facility registration. Um, this does apply to park districts, travel leagues, um, outdoor sports, um, and recreation is allowed. Um, participant groups and practices outdoor limited to 10 people or less, um, implementing um, proper social distancing, and um, locker rooms should remain closed, like we mentioned earlier, and face coverings um, are required for all um, activities. Next slide, please. Personal care, um, this would be, um, you know, salon services or barber um, services operating um, at 25 clients or 25% of the capacity um, in accordance to um, uh, fire regulations. Um, face coverings must be worn by clients um, for services provided. Um, if um, if the service requires the face covering to be, to be removed, that is prohibited. So suspend services where a face covering cannot be worn. Um, physical occupation and massage therapy allowed 
as deemed necessary by your provider, your medical provider. Um, appointments must be spaced um, between um, these types of services to allow for sanitation to um, occur or to, to have that done between appointments, making sure that there's proper ventilation um, in the room as well. And, um, you know, if, if any of the services can be done virtually, it is recommended to, to do that in, instead. Next slide, please. And for retail spaces, um, we ask that operate at 25% capacity. Um, and this includes um, general merchandise stores, the so stores that have um, other merchandise outside of um, groceries and pharmacy um, and convenience stores. Stores um, that only have um, food and pharmacies may operate at 50% of capacity. And we encourage um, delivery and curbside um, pickup options when possible. And making sure that, you know, when you do go grocery shopping to take the necessary um, health precautions with, um, you know, hand sanitation and face masks and making sure you try to be as efficient as possible, um, you know, during your, um, your trip and trying to limit that um, exposure of being close to, to other individuals. Next slide, please. And okay. that's, that wraps up my side. Thank you, Agnes. Um, I really appreciate it. It was very informative, but um, Agnes is gonna stay with us. And please, if you're on, um, just uh, put your questions into the Zoom or Q&A feature uh, and the Q&A feature on the Zoom or in the Facebook Live, you can put it in the comments section. Um, but thank you very much. I appreciate um, your uh, input and your expertise. Um, next, we're gonna be hearing from Amanda Meal and Michelle Gibson from the Boone County Health Department. You know, they're on the front lines and have been working tirelessly uh, since the onset of COVID and continue to provide up-to-date and local information to Fort Boone and the entire community. So thank you very much for being here. Amanda. Hi, Pam, thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Amanda Mail here at the Boone County Health Department. It's my pleasure to be presenting with Agnes and uh, Michelle and the Growth Dimension staff and the uh, Chamber of Commerce staff here in Belvedere and also the YMCA team. Um, I wanna thank the community for their continue, um, continued participation in our forward forums. And I wanna thank everybody for working really hard to do your part to try to curb the spread of COVID-19. We are finding ourselves in really a very serious uh, situation right now with our second wave of COVID and the surge within that second wave that we're experiencing. And I know this is tough with the weather getting colder and with uh, the holidays upon us. Um, I'm very sad to not be seeing my family um, in person this year for the holidays. And I know that this is a really hard time for everyone. So thanks again. Um, I was asked just to make sure that I could clarify a little bit about how the positivity rate is calculated. I think it's very alarming to people right now because the positivity rate in Boone County is so high um, that we're getting a lot of questions about this, right? How is it calculated and how is this, um, how is this determined? So one of the calls that we get the most right now in our office is, so if we have a 30% positivity rate, that means that one third of Boone County's population is infected with COVID. And I wanna go ahead and dispel that myth right now and make sure that people are clear that um, when you calculate the positivity rate, you're not taking the total population. That would be an in, incorrect way to do that. We're looking at total positive tests um, divided by tests performed, and that's how we get the positivity rate, uh, right? And so it does not reflect the county's entire population. I think the other thing that people have concerns about is that perhaps our positivity rate is inflated if people go and get multiple tests, right? Um, so I want to dispel that myth as well. So if I, Amanda, go and get tested three times in a two week period and all of my tests are negative, then all of my tests go into that calculation. Um, if I go and all of my tests are positive, then that number gets calculated in the numerator of the equation and in the denominator. So I know I'm getting into kind of nerdy math things, but then that means it cancels itself out, right? So if I'm in there three times, you've got my test in the numerator divided by my test in the denominator. So 
the state health department is using metrics that that they didn't design they're using metrics that are designed at the national and the worldwide level to track disease and to track transmission. And so the way that a positivity rate is calculated is based on what data analysts at the national and global level have determined to be the appropriate way to look at statistical analysis. So I know it can be very confusing. Um, I don't want anybody to think that the positivity rate shouldn't be alarming because it definitely is. But I want to make sure people are clear that it's not one in every three people walking around Boone County that has COVID-19. We can go to the next slide. Great, thank you so much. So just a brief update. Um, yesterday's numbers reflected um, a case count that came in in a one day period of 63 cases. Um, total cumulatively over the period of time from April when we saw our first confirmed positive case until now, we've had 3,295 uh, cases. Um, yesterday, we did not report out any deaths, but we have had a total of 29 deaths of Boone County residents due to COVID-19. Um, I also have listed here the Illinois daily case count as well as the cumulative cases and the Illinois daily death count as well as the cumulative uh, deaths, which is obviously very sad for us to be losing, losing fellow, fellow residents of Illinois to this disease. Um, our positivity rate is, as you can see, more than twice the Illinois uh, rate, so it's, it's very high. Uh, we have quite a bit of disease circulating here in Boone County. I get lots of questions most days about where are the hot spots? What should we watch out for? Is it in the factories? Is it in the bars and restaurants? Is it in the schools? Where is it? Um, guys, I'm just going to be really honest. It is absolutely everywhere right now. We have so much disease circulating that our contact tracing team is tracing it back to really all workplaces, all locations. We have positive cases being reported from all sectors, large, small, all types of workplaces. People are still having social events and gathering on weekends and nights. It's spreading that way during private events. So we're seeing a lot of it and we are doing our best definitely to respond to the needs of the community. Um, you all can help us by getting the word out that um, still the basic three W's, wearing your mask, watching your distance and washing your hands is the best way to prevent the spread. Um, and we would ask you so kindly to focus on what the governor and Dr. Azike have been stating in their press conferences about these upcoming holidays. The safest way to celebrate the holidays this year with your family is virtually. Um, there's also some guidelines too. If there are going to be any in-person gatherings, there, the safest way to do that is outlined um, on the State Health Department website. And we have also put that stuff out through social media um, and on our website as well. Um, we are encouraging everyone this year to um, get their flu shot. It's not too late. We have not started to see too much influenza circulating in the community, um, but it's definitely coming on a normal flu season, which I, I don't think this year is going to be a normal flu season. Um, don't really know exactly what to expect as far as how much circulation that we will see. Um, but normally we start to see an uptick tick during a normal flu season um, after Thanksgiving and right around the holiday season. So we would anticipate to start to see some flu circulating. Takes a couple weeks to really build those antibodies up in your system. So if you haven't already gone to get your flu shot, I would definitely encourage you to do so. It's a simple thing that you can do to protect yourself against influenza. We don't want uh, COVID patients in the hospitals. Right now, we want to keep people as healthy as possible. We also want to avoid people being hospitalized because of contracting the influenza virus or contracting both at the same time. Uh, thank you all so much, Pam. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Amy Grafton and Lee Revels with the Belvedere Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, they're heavily involved in assisting businesses that they work through the restrictions. Um, they've come along uh, with Restore Illinois phases and mitigation. So thank you very much, Amy. Hi, Pam. Thanks for having me here today. Um, obviously, the Chamber's number one focus is to support our local community businesses. Um, we do that regardless if you're a Chamber member or not. Um, but I also want to stress that there are um, additional ways that we can support your business if you do become a member. So I just want to highlight these um, top three ways that we can support you um, and your business. So promoting your business and specials through our email database, which is about 900 um, people, and through our social media outlets. 
um, referrals. We get tons of phone calls at the chamber on a daily basis um, asking where they can find uh, certain types of businesses, where they should go for this or that, and we refer our chamber members first. Um, and we also encourage our chamber members to um, refer each other. So those are two big things. Um, our last thing um, is networking opportunities. And although uh, with us being in tier three mitigation, we have been able to continue um, to provide networking opportunities uh, throughout COVID um, based on the numbers and the guidelines. So although we're at um, 10 people right now and, and it can't be outside of certain areas, uh, when we get back to the numbers of 25 and 50, we will be um, getting together on these things so people can share information about their businesses. Um, you can attend those free of charge as a member and you can host them to get out information about your business. Next slide. I am going to hand it over to Lee, the executive assistant, to go over some of the additional technology that we have that can support you through the chamber, which can be very costly if you go to um, other businesses or services to obtain these uh, pieces of technology. Lee? Thank you, Amy. So, so as Amy mentioned, one of the ways that we can help is through some innovative technology. And one of the pieces I would highlight for that is an e-commerce system. So if you have a small business that would like to set up curbside pickup, but don't have the resources to be able to do that on your own, that's a way that we can help. Or if you want to set up delivery or how to ship some of your goods. Um, one of the other things that I'd love to highlight today is that if you have the ability, um, we are hosting a Belvedere small business shopping event on Saturday, November 28th from 10 to four. So if you would stop by and support some of our local small businesses and some local small vendors that we would greatly appreciate that. Next slide, please. And so in order to support our community, there's a few other things that we would just ask if you're able to, um, these are some ways to help. So. Uh, about half of these are things that you can do with no money at all. They're just ways that you would help in the community. And then some of them are, if you have the resources, ways that you might help financially. Um, I know that one of the things that I do regularly is donating blood. And anytime that I go in there, they're very happy to see me. And there's been um, a lot of shortages lately. So that's one way to help in the community. Checking on some of those people that you uh, that are alone and may need some help, even if it's just a text message, so you're not actually going to the, their door, but thinking about creative ways that you can help our community um, through this. N next slide. And now I'm going to hand it back to Amy as she talks a little bit more about volunteering in the community. Yeah, so it's really important that all of our organizations in Boone County support each other um, and, and reach out when we can help or help when we can. So the Boone County Council on Aging is asking for volunteers. They have many elderly people that are engaged with the Boone County Council on Aging that they need um, volunteers to make phone calls to, to check in on them. There's a lot of um, depression and um, worry that they don't understand what's going on and they just need somebody to talk to. So if you're interested in being a volunteer and would like to help them make some phone calls and just check in on some people and maybe there's some other volunteer jobs that they have for you too, you can give Kelly a call and the number's on the bottom of the screen and she'd be happy to have you volunteer with them. Next slide. Thank you, Amy. And, and thank you to all of our panelists for sharing um, these wonderful resources, um, your expertise, and for providing us with your support throughout this very difficult time. Um, while we don't have all the answers, we're certainly going to try. And so if you have any questions, please um, submit them in the Q&A feature. Unfortunately, we did lose our li live feed to Facebook. Um, but we will try to answer these questions. If not today, then we'll try to do it at another time. Um, so, uh, but in just that, it sounds like that we have a lot of um, support that um, is available that we're hoping that people will participate in um, 
providing uh, with uh, giving. This is the time of giving. And we want to just encourage everyone to try to take advantage of these um, wonderful resources that uh, the chamber had outlined uh, through giving blood, through, you know, paying for somebody's meals, uh, for doing whatever you can in order to um, help those more in need. Um, so there's a, a couple questions that came in. Um, have any businesses been flagged or given notices to close? And is that for the health department, I think? We have not closed any businesses due to COVID-19 to date. Thank you. Um, what, if any, will be the repercussions for businesses or individuals who violate these news restrictions? Hi, it's Amanda here at the health department. I'm just going to start and then turn it over to my teammate, Michelle, who's on the phone. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody is clear that there are a couple of different things going on. Um, there was a JCAR emergency ruling um, back several months ago um, that allowed for uh, legal action um, to be taken against uh, really any facility, business, um, any entity that was violating uh, masking or social distancing. There's that. Then there are the regional tiered mitigations that are being um, organized via executive order. Those are two separate topics. Um, and I'm going to have Michelle address those now on the call so that everybody is clear on the difference between the two. And I can really only speak for the health department's role with that locally. Um, and there may be other organizations at the state or local level that are involved in that, but we would only be able to speak to the health department role. So Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. So what we've done is we've tried to um, take it from an educational route with all of our businesses, letting them know, as Amanda explained, that these are two separate things. We do have many businesses that even though in tier two, we were um, ordered to not have indoor dining, who have chosen to continue to do indoor dining. So what we've seen our role is, in is going out to see the safety of that, we don't um, we don't necessarily advocate indoor dining. In fact, we are promoting that all businesses do the drive drive up and pick up and delivery. But we do want to make sure that we keep we're keeping our um, Boone County residents as safe as possible. So we have definitely had some businesses that have violated the masking portion of the rules that JCAR allows us to enforce. And we have um, gone in to enforce and educate with that. But as far as the indoor dining is concerned, we are trying to make sure that if, res if, if restaurants choose to do this, that they're doing it as safely as possible so that all patrons are wearing masks, all servers and um, workers are wearing masks, that constant sanitation is happening. Um, and that tables are socially distanced as they, sh as they should be inside and outside. Um, but that by no means means that we condone it, but we are just trying to help educate and keep everyone safe. Okay. Is there a, a threshold for uh, all non-essential businesses being closed? And I, I believe the question is, uh, what do they need to do to be reopened? So, so to move originally to move from tier um, two back to tier one, we needed to get below a 6.5% positivity rate. Um, now that we have actually moved into tier three, we need to get below a 12% positivity rate. And I'll let Amanda kind of explain more details about how that works. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So Amanda here at the health department. Um, so when we're talking about the positivity rate for the tiered mitigations, that's done by region. And so it would, um, as far as the tier three uh, mitigations that all 11 um, regions in the state of Illinois are under, um, I am not sure at this moment exactly what the plan would be for a region that was able to achieve the level that they needed to achieve to potentially move out of tier three mitigation if that occurred in some regions before others. But I know that how it has worked up until this point is that region by region, if a region is able to sustain that seven day rolling positivity 
uh, rate average of the threshold that's been determined um, and get below that for three consecutive days, then that entire region moves down a tier and or moves out of mitigation and into the regular Restore Illinois phase, which as Agnes mentioned earlier in the presentation um, is phase four of Restore Illinois. Uh, these next two questions are kind of similar, so I'm going to ask them, answer, or ask them together. Um, what has led to Boone County having such a high positivity rate compared to the state and, um, and even within Region 1? Um, so our neighboring counties have had a lower um, number, yet we are the, one of the smallest counties in the region. So why do we have such a high positivity rate? Hi, uh, good afternoon, Amanda again here at the health department. Um, so what we are seeing across the state right now is that this second wave and the surge now within the second wave is really hitting rural counties hard. Um, so I think at the beginning of this in the spring, uh, we saw large urban areas like New York City, Chicago, um, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Houston, some of those huge cities were really hit hard with COVID at the beginning. And many of us in rural communities were kind of waiting for our first case, right? Like we knew it was circulating. We knew that, you know, diseases don't know jurisdictional boundaries. So at some point, you know, if it continued to grow at the rate it was growing, that we would probably see cases. Um, and now in the second wave, we're being hit much harder than, than our urban neighbors. Um, I can speak to what I'm seeing within our contact tracing efforts here at the Boone County Health Department as we're doing interviews. Um, we are finding that um, many individuals are choosing to congregate uh, nights and weekends, have private gatherings. Um, we have businesses that are choosing not to follow the mitigations. Uh, we have put out a lot of educational materials and we have folks that are um, choosing not to heed some of those warnings. So I do truly believe that that is contributing to how high our positivity rate is. Um, we have a lot of travel going on um, between Wisconsin and Illinois and between Iowa and Illinois, given where our region is located, um, bumping up against those two states that have uh, positivity rates that are um, very, very high, much higher than the Illinois positivity rate. So all of those things, unfortunately, are contributing to the situation that we're finding ourselves in. Thank you. Um, can you explain why the mitigation efforts don't cover the schools? And is it just that they want to leave it up to the local direction? Agnes, maybe you want to address that one. Oh, I think we might have lost Agnes. Um, so uh, I don't know, Amanda, would you want to share what direction you've been? Because I know you've been working, the health department has been working very closely with the um, school districts and Boone County. Um, sure. Sure. Just don't cover the schools. Yes, I'd be happy to just um, share the little bit of information that I have. Um, I know that this question has been posed um, at the 2.30 press conferences that the governor has on, on quite a few occasions by um, leaders and members of the media. Um, I have also been a part of leadership conversations at the state level where the health department had, um, administrators have asked for clarification on that. So the Illinois State Board of Education and the Illinois Department of Public Health came out with a joint document um, back over the summer, late summer, with guidelines for um, what schools would need to do and how they would logistically need to operate to um, keep their respective schools separate. Um, and when, when asking the question throughout the last couple of months as to whether that process would change, uh, we have been told that it will continue to be something at least as of November 20th, right? Friday, November 20th. Um, it's something that is up to the local jurisdiction, the um, local school boards and the local health departments to discuss amongst themselves. Um, every school district is uh, set up differently. School buildings are set up differently. Neighborhoods are different. Um, schools have different uh, remote access capabilities. So it has been left to the local um, leaders to make those determinations county by county. Um, and when asked if that will change in the near future, the answer that we've considered consistently gotten is that it will continue to be um, distributed at the local level for control. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple questions and I think maybe there are a couple statements. Um, just to, for clarification, restaurants cannot operate indoors within the county. 
or in the state of Illinois. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And, um, and I, I think um, the question in this next one is um, who is enforcing that? How is it being enforced? So we are going out into the local restaurants. We are enforcing this, but we are limited with our ability to shut restaurants down. Um, our food code is not, does not cover COVID related um, issues. So our ability to shut down for food violations is different than our ability to shut down for indoor dining. Um, so at this time, what we've chosen to do is focus more on the masking rather than the indoor dining. Not that we, we're not focused on it, but we don't have the authority to shut them down the way a lot of people would be calling for. I hope that that has uh, clarified some questions. And I, I do know that there's been a lot of discussion about further enforcement um, throughout the state, throughout the region and in the local area. So we will um, share, once we have that information, we will share that with others. Um, so since this um, statewide placement into tier three mitigation, what are the requirements to move back into tier two or one? Amanda, would you be able to answer that question for us? Yes, sure. So that would be what we were um, just discussing, how um, we're waiting for some additional information on exactly what that would look like as far as whether like a region could move out of tier three on their own if they were successfully able to maintain a positivity rate that was below the required threshold at or below the required threshold for three uh, consecutive days. I have not um, gotten confirmation on that yet or not because this is the first time um, since the spring when we were all under the same um, orders and all under the same guidelines that we've been um, doing something all together as a state. But it's my understanding, and Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, because you have been our sort of our liaison for tier three mitigations um, in our office over the last couple of days as we have been learning about what that means. But it's my understanding that the new threshold to get out of tier three and move back down to a previous tier is 12% positivity rate in a region for three consecutive days. Michelle, is that, can you confirm that for me? Yes, that is um, what the guidance says as of right now. Thank you. Okay, we have a lot of comments and questions regarding authority and the law. Um, and I believe, and correct me if, I, uh, if I'm wrong, that the governor did deflect this to the local state's attorneys to enforce, but I do know that the local state's attorneys are reviewing uh, language and seeing what authority they actually do have. Um, is this correct, Amanda? Can you confirm yes, that? Th yes, that is correct. Um, what should we do if we observe a business or an institution not following mitigation guidelines? We do um, accept complaint calls. We do have a, a COVID hotline, or you can call the health department directly, and we follow up on every call that we get. We go to every business in person, um, and we assess what they're doing, how they're doing it, um, and we give them education to correct anything that they're doing wrong. And we do continue to watch those businesses to see if they're, if they're um, sticking to what the mitigations are or if they're not. Thank you. Hi, it's Amanda. Uh, Pam, do you mind if I just make one more comment? We'll go right ahead. Okay, great. Um, so the process that we have here in our office, um, just to make sure that everybody is clear that is uh, joining us on this call, um, is we have a COVID-19 information line and then we also have a COVID-19 information email. Uh, we have obviously our main health department line as well. It is through those three channels that we are primarily getting the majority of our complaints. Uh, we also do receive complaints um, and information about businesses that are not following mitigations or are not following the JCAR ruling regarding masking and social distancing um, also on our Facebook page and then all of the staff that work here in the department often get emails to their uh, their work email accounts so we do our best to channel all of those through 
one or two staff members that are the point person for receiving those complaints. Uh, we have a way in which we organize that in a spreadsheet. And um, just to be very clear and transparent with everybody, you know, if there's more than one call, we log the number of calls, when they come in, what business they pertain to. Um, and Michelle, I don't know if you have an exact um, current count, um, but I want to make sure everybody on this call understands the enormous volume of calls that we are getting related to complaints. Michelle, can you give everybody just an idea of the workload that is required to respond to the situation that we find ourselves in? So we get probably hundreds of calls. I would say at least 100 calls a month. We have two staff members that are dedicated to all of our environmental um, needs for the county. And they also are following up on all of these complaints. They go in person, they provide paperwork, they talk to local business owners, they discuss what their options are. Um, they follow up within 24 hours on every complaint that we get. They spend 20, probably 20 to 30 hours a week just handling these complaints in addition to their normal duties of um, keeping the water safe, keeping your food safe, keeping um, the septic system safe and all the other duties that an environmental health staff would do. So they do spend a significant portion of their time just answering these complaints. Can you quantify for us how many complaints you've gotten about businesses not following guidelines? Um, I would say it depends. With each business, we do get multiple complaints about some of the same businesses over and over, but consecutively over the last eight to nine months, we've probably gotten over, over 500 calls, definitely, and emails and people walking in in person to complain and Facebook messages of complaint, well over 500. Um, I can give you guys an exact answer when I look back at it again, but again, we're so busy trying to answer these calls. I don't have the exact number in my head. Understand. <laughs> um, so what happens if somebody receives a call from a contract tracer um, and, or what information would you send if you are reporting that possible exposure in a business? Yeah, that's a great question. Hi, Amanda here at the health department. Um, so we have several contact tracers that are um, trained and focused uh, primarily on potential outbreaks. And so the way that that works is um, when the person calls, um, depending on what the exposure potentially was, what type of business it is, um, exactly, you know, where they're located and um, where we might anticipate spread occurring, there are specific um, things that we would ask for in addition to, right? Um, there are also some considerations regarding HIPAA and privacy matters that we have to be very careful of as well. So depending on exactly who's calling and uh, what they're referencing and what the potential exposure was, um, there are questions related to you know, lists of individuals that work within the facility, uh, whether there was a shift change, if there's a certain shift that works with an individual, um, you know, the context of the people that are working in the facility, um, the types of symptoms that they're having. Um, we have records coming into our office as far as testing information where we could um, confirm or compare information that we receive from a complaint or a call to the information within our um, electronic medical records system. Um, those may be things that we are not able to discuss with the person that calls and reports that, um, but it then allows us to go out, as Michelle had mentioned, and investigate further um, to see what may be going on. And then we pass those projects on specifically to the contact tracers on the team that have been trained in um, outbreak response and management. Thank you very much. I'm trying to see if I have any uh, additional questions. Um, I just wanted to uh, provide a reminder to everyone. Um, the chamber had a page of um, resources and ways that you can uh, give um, and prevent the co uh, spread of COVID. Um, but uh, if you would like, um, we can share some information from the Keen Age Center about, um, and Kelly Hillman, 
uh, Helen and said uh, to give her a call at the Teenage Center if you want to provide phone calls to um, our elderly. Um, also, um, if you could, um, uh, let me see, there was another um, support, uh, give blood, they definitely need it. I just wanted to uh, uh, point that out. And also, um, it's very important that you support um, our local and regional businesses. Um, they are hurting. And so if you have the opportunity to give, please give buy a, a gift card, share it with somebody who needs it more than you. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you uh, for all our residents um, and um, everybody that has uh, joined us today. Um, if you have any questions that maybe we didn't address or you need further clarification, please go to forwardboon.org. We have links to all these uh, partners, um, and we will try to address those at your earliest convenience. Thank Pam. you again. Yes. Pam, I just wanted to remind everyone that we have the free testing sites starting again in Boone County um, with Fiesta Market this Sunday. Mm -hmm. If you look on the health department, Boone County Health Department's page, and I believe the Forward Boone page, there's a list of all those dates and locations. Yes, thank you very much. So get your flu shot. I just got mine before this meeting, um, <laughs> the presentation. Uh, stay healthy. Please wear your mask um, and have a wonderful holiday. Thank you all. We had one more question too. I'm sorry. Yes, I just see that. Okay. Uh, what can you say to residents of Boone County that everyone is working to get this situation under control? Well, I'm going to first start and I'll let uh, everybody on uh, the panelists to address it, but you know, I don't think any of us have all the answers. We're all trying to do the best we can. Um, that's why Forward Boone started is because we wanted leaders to work together and support one another to try to figure out what those answers are and what the best way to provide that support. Um, we're very fortunate to have our education, our um, elected officials, our healthcare, our business organizations, community-based organizations, our healthcare systems, all together working to try to address some of these questions. So um, I don't know if any of us have this under control, but what we're trying to do is find out what the root causes are, how we can help support it, how we can support our businesses and into our community and provide you with the best education and resources that we have available. Anybody else want to share? Pam, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think it's just about us working together and a, as a big community and a team to get the numbers down because it's not, it, one person can't do this alone. Absolutely. Hi, Pam, it's Amanda from the health department. Um, I said this on a press conference that we had uh, back when our positivity rate first uh, was rising above the 8%. And I'd like to share it again with this group. Um, I think that the term that has been coined recently that um, is kind of a new buzzword, but I really think it rings true for, true for most people, pandemic fatigue has set in hardcore, right? Um, and I um, would be lying if I said that the members of the Boone County Health Department team aren't also feeling the pandemic fatigue, right? Um, it's a lot of work um, to handle day after day. And even those of you that aren't necessarily on the front lines fighting it. Um, it's exhausting to deal with remote learning for your children. It's exhausting to figure out how to operate a business in the midst of all this. It's exhausting to work for a social service organization where you're getting calls and you can't always help everybody. It's exhausting to be a local elected official and, and try to answer the questions of your concerned constituents. So we're all tired and unfortunately now we're being asked to work even harder than we had to work in the spring to combat this. So we're kind of up against a lot of challenges. Um, and I think it would be good if everybody could um, really take a moment and reflect at some point in the near future, like what is your why to keep you going and keep you focused on why we're all in this together and who are you doing this for, right? Maybe you're doing this for a family member that struggles from 
um, a mental health condition because of the stress of the pandemic. Maybe you're doing this because you have a family member who um, has lost their lives to COVID-19 or has been in the hospital. Maybe you're doing it because you have a family member who's a healthcare worker in the hospital and is working, you know, 18 hour shifts and just absolutely exhausted. Maybe you're, you know, working hard to follow the guidelines because you you don't want your favorite local business to go out of business because of the mitigations like whatever your why is especially going into the holidays if you can focus on that and try to stay focused on that one reason why you're going to be in it with us to try to help us get through this i think it really can help right it would really make a difference if people can uh, focus on their why and just hunker down and work with us on this because we know it's hard for everybody I also wanted to say that there might be some people in our audience that have some creative ideas and some solutions. Please feel free to share those with us. And, and you know, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, we, we try to provide all those resources for you. And like I said, links to um, our partners on forwardboon.org. Uh, a, a recording of this will be available both on Facebook and on the website. So, um, we want to help you um, if there's ways that we can capture some unmet needs or ways that um, you think that we could uh, address um, some new solutions, some innovative ideas, please feel free to share them with us. Again, we want to thank you, everybody, um, and uh, for joining us today. And we look forward to the next Forward Forum and hearing from you. Good night. Happy Thanksgiving.